What's up guys? So let's talk about Salem and why I think she has to be, without a doubt, the worst villain ever introduced into Ruby. Now as always, if you haven't caught up with most of the recent volumes, please don't watch this as there are spoilers ahead. That's your only warning and I'm not going to say it again. Before you jump on my case about this, uh, let me explain. Salem was initially introduced in the opening monologue of Volume 1, appearing to have a back and forth with Ozpin, both speaking of a single soul, later revealed to be Ruby Rose, the series protagonist. At the time, she was a faceless figure and no one, not even myself, suspected that there was a larger foe at work here. We all assumed that Cinder was the main antagonist and probably the one speaking given both her power and her plan that was introduced in Volume 2. A lot of people have mixed feelings about Cinder, feeling that she is overly sexualized or just plain old generic mwahahaha villain, but if I'm being honest here in the first three volumes, I actually really liked her character as this kind of profound, arrogant powerhouse. At the time, I also associated her heavily with Cinderella, obviously, and figured that there was maybe some twisted motivation for everything she was doing, but I won't get too much into Cinder, uh, maybe in another video. For now, let's go back to Salem. We don't actually see Salem until the end of Volume 3, where the monologue continues and we see that Salem is in some broken, strange land filled with grim and just general evil things. Now, obviously, I assume that this was an ode to the Wicked Witch of the West, and in recent volumes, it's pretty much straight up that. But still, I was somewhat interested in Salem as a character, as she was the new big baddie. And in no small part to the voice actress being Jen Taylor, the voice of Cortana in the Halo series, which just so happens to be my favorite video game and book series. However, everything changed when the terrible character writing of Ruby attacked. How can I say this by putting it nicely? Salem isn't really a character. During the events of Volume 4, Salem is introduced as the big baddie that has been lurking in the shadows, working on some grand evil scheme to control the world, and Cinder is just one of her many lackeys who can't hope to stand up to her. I've talked about this before, but I'll talk about it again. When the new villains of Volume 4 were introduced, it trivialized the villains of the first three volumes. Roman, Neo, Mercury, Emerald, Adam, they are all second rate and no longer worth worrying about. Now, we have villains like Cinder being trivialized by other characters who are presumably on the same level. In my opinion, there are ways to do this appropriately. Now, you might not like this anime, but I'm going to use it as an example. Take Bleach. Aizen Sosuke is introduced as the main antagonist. His power literally dwarfs the strongest characters in the show by a large margin. He is cunning, ridiculously intelligent, and absolutely absurd with everything he does. It's not even a contest when he fights someone as he appears virtually invulnerable. However, when he initially leaves Soul Society, it is revealed that he too has some nifty lackeys in the background that dwarf the power of all the current characters, ranked from 0 to 9. One by one, and in almost numerical order, these characters are defeated by the protagonist, ranging from an intense struggle to a casual killing. This helped us know that the main characters were increasing in power, and maybe when the final confrontation came, they would stand a chance, mainly with the series protagonist, Ichigo, who is overpowered in his own right, but only barely able to stand up against the sixth most powerful Espada, Grimjow. He struggles and through battles eventually becomes able to fight Aizen toe to toe. However, when it first comes time to fight Aizen, it is shown that Aizen is still worlds away in terms of power and even he himself views those beneath him as pathetically powerless. The key to Aizen's strength was his sword, which could inflict illusions on anyone who witnessed it once it was released. Ichigo, the series protagonist, had never witnessed the release, meaning that he, and only he, could fight Aizen face to face. Fast forward when Ichigo finally manages to, to defeat Aizen. We learn that Aizen was always stronger than everyone else and was just lonely. He wanted someone as strong as him and when he didn't fight anybody, he changed and set his goal on something impossible. Basically the destruction of the world. This character is similar to how Salem is portrayed. All powerful, legions of disposable lackeys, power that is seemingly infinite, but has a crutch that only the main character can manipulate. Ichigo has never seen Aizen's sword, and Ruby has the silver eyes that harm Grimm. But why is it that Salem's character falls so short? Let's look into her backstory, the point where we would either care for this character or see them as a cardboard cutout. Volume 6, Episode 3, The Lost Fable. This episode opens where the other one took off, explaining that Salem was locked away and it wasn't until a brave hero, Ozma, stormed the castle that she was able to escape. It is explained that Ozma did not want to save Salem for her beauty, but rather fought for justice and righteousness. He prevails, and he and Salem escape. 
They live happily ever after, until Ozma is stricken with disease and dies a premature death. Salem resolves to go to one of the two brothers, gods of light and dark that created all things. She goes to the light brother, obviously because he controls life, and requests that he brings back Ozma. He denies, claiming that life and death are a delicate balance, and that she should respect that and let Ozma rest. This makes sense. This is reasonable. Most people understand that this makes sense and would not press this issue any further. Then Salem, being the amazing villainess that she is, screams that this isn't fair. The brother disappears, leaving Salem to resort to other means. She goes to the other brother, the ruler of death, and asks of him the same, not mentioning that she previously went to the older brother. This is a big plot hole, as the other brother quickly does what she asks, resurrecting Ozma. If she had gone to him first, the ruler of death, everything following would have been completely avoided, or in the least the fight between the brothers would have continued. Who knows what that might have done in the world forever, or at least in the gods, which she later wants to happen. I mean, geez, this just doesn't make sense. Let that sink in. So far, Salem has performed a perversion to anyone who has ever known loss. She was grieving, and instead of being content that life ends, she demands that it doesn't. She feels it should change for her and her alone. And in doing so, she causes a cataclysm. The scene was just really kind of dumb to me. Um, the, the one brother erases Ozma from existence, the other brother brings him back, and then erases him from existence again. It's like they're just playing with my man Ozma. He's coming back and he's dying, he's coming back, he's dying, it's annoying. So anyway, the two brothers decide that since Salem has been such a stubborn and selfish woman, they are going to make her immortal for uh, w whatever reason. Here's the problem with this. It's been done so many times, it isn't even funny. This is, I'm guessing, a callback to the whole fable thing. A lover dies and the other lover tries to resurrect that person and is somehow stricken with the curse to live forever with the specific notion of until the world ends, which eventually drives them to trying to end the world. There are a few books where I've read that have this, but the most prominent one I can think of is Name of the Wind, where a powerful witch-type woman dies after bringing back her warrior lover, and the lover tries to gain the same power to bring her back too, but fails. Then once he decides to end his own life to be with her, he finds that she had accidentally made him immortal by bringing him back to life. So he, who is now a powerful wizard in his own right, literally destroys his own kingdom and tries to slaughter all of humanity in order to evoke the rage of the gods, for only they could undo his curse and finally erase him from existence. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend getting it. It's awesome. Very complex, though. Kind of hard to read. It's a cool idea, but all I'm saying is that it's been done better. And most of the time when it's done, you feel bad for the person who is immortal. You genuinely feel for them. I don't feel for Salem. So then Salem decides that the gods are being big old meanies, so she's going to get revenge on them since they are fallible, since they argued. She convinces literally everyone on the planet to destroy the gods because she stole immortality from them and therefore they could be immortal too. She learns how to manipulate people to such an extent that even when that very same god is literally right in front of them, they'll still try to kill it. Like, these people, for all their lives, have been taught that the gods were great and awesome, and then they're just like, oh, fuck it, let's kill them. Whatever. I mean, that makes sense. Now, when the gods cursed Salem with immortality, they told her that she needs to learn the value of life and death. Only then will she know peace. Instead of reflecting on that and, you know, trying to understand what it meant, Salem literally tries to kill the gods. It is heavily implied in that moment that once Salem learns to accept Ozma's death, she would be able to pass on. Salem thinks that this ragtag handful of magical wielding bros and gals can actually kill the gods. So what does the dark god do in return for this? He literally wipes humanity off the face of the planet in a fashion more cruel than Thanos' finger snap. Salem continues to whine, saying that she will make a new army to come back and defeat them. Unfortunately, there's no one left. Salem is the last human alive, and the gods intend to leave. This is actually kind of fun, because we learn this is where the name Remnant comes from, and also how the moon was destroyed. So, I mean, that's the highlight of the episode. Anyway... Salem is alone and wandering the planet. It's even stated that Salem blames everyone and everything for her current predicament except for herself. She decides that the only way to kill herself is to jump into the brother's darkness pool of evil goo. 
Now, this might not resonate too much with me, obviously. I mean, obviously, evil and twisted things emerge from the pool. It doesn't appear to be death itself, rather just, you know, the dark side of light. And of course, you know, I mean, originally it was implied that, you know, her immortality was given by both the brothers, you know. It's, it's heavily implied that life and death are part of a delicate balance, one that both the brothers originally aimed to maintain. Until Salem manages to somehow bypass this with this pool hack with her infinite life and also become an infinitely evil, powerful thing. I mean, I, I, I just don't understand what they're implying here, that she wasn't originally kind of a narcissistic bitch. Like, literally everything she's done has been like a negative thing. How more evil could Salem be when she literally caused the extinction of humanity and still blames everyone but herself? I mean... Why bother reflecting on what they originally told you about cherishing life? Now, just get all of humanity wiped out and throw a tantrum for centuries until you try and jump in the leftover god spunk pool. Makes perfect sense. So Ozma is between realms, and the Brother of Light gives some heavy exposition. Basically, if all the relics are found, the gods will be summoned, and humanity will be judged. This is also where the God of Light decides to give him the ability to reincarnate and task him with ensuring humanity will be worthy. Kind of a huge responsibility. Homeboy was just resting, you know, he wanted to be in the afterlife. We can also guess Salem's intention here. She wants to summon the gods to get her revenge by collecting all the relics, blah blah blah. Salem and Ozma finally meet after all these years. As soon as they meet, they're immediately lovey-dovey. So they share their tales and both of them lie to each other. Great relationship, this one. Salem blames the end of the world on the gods. Big shock here. Salem then decides that they should become the gods of this world and create a paradise. Like, what? And Ozma's just like, lit. So they get this kingdom, they have kids. Four kids. Four girls. Hmm. Almost like the four maidens, huh? The four kids that can perform magic. Born of an immortal and a reincarnating man. Who else has immortal semblances that reincarnate the ability to perform magic? I mean, I'm a little too on the nose here. So anyway... Salem is clearly being a bit of a psycho here, deciding that war is the only way to deal with the current state of the world. You know, in most cases, I would tend to agree that war is, you know, probably one of the best ways that you can deal with a warring world. But still, Ozma is like, this ain't it, fam. So they fight. Salem clearly doesn't care that her kids are nearby and might get caught in the crossfire, and seemingly did get caught in the crossfire, as we never see them again. It's heavily implied that she killed her own kids. Like, what the fuck? So the flashback ends, and I no longer care about Salem as a character. Now she is this horribly transparent, unkillable powerhouse for absolutely no reason. Her whole mindset as a character was actually a whiny teenager who was upset about the way the world was, and came to the conclusion that the world should change for her and her alone, regardless of the consequences to everyone else. How can this be considered an interesting character, or a decent villain? It certainly isn't going to be very much of a good villain, I'll tell you that much. Especially if the final confrontation is coming in Volume 7. It's just not going to be good. Now I know I'm doing this again, but has anyone watched Naruto Shippuden? The end of it. The end end. I'm going to spoil it briefly regardless. Uchiha Madara was a main main antagonist, a powerhouse that had finally achieved his plan, and now all the heroes had to defeat him. However, at the last confrontation, it was revealed that Madara was just a pawn, and the true villain was a woman named Kaguya, who possessed infinite power in every technique ever, and that was the final boss. Our protagonists fight her against staggering odds, but she is boring. She is immortal, has infinite power, virtually no personality. She hardly reacts to anything. She has to be sealed, and that's it. She is sealed. That was the end. I feel like Salem is about to be on the same level. If not, she's already on the same level. As Cinder was introduced as the kind of sexy, smooth-talking, almost lust-esque villainess, we definitely didn't need another one. The only difference is Salem's lines aren't sexy or interesting. They're just kind of... Ha, 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 ha. And that's the only way I can describe it. She just comes off as like a basic cardboard cutout of a villain. Like, you know how in volume four, when she was, at, or volume three at the end of it, when she was actually introduced and it was just kind of like, it was obviously just like not animated. It was just a picture that was like slightly moving. That's basically her whole character. In an animated moving show, she is a still picture. It's boring. She has tantrums and has absolutely no character. I don't know why this is, but I just can't get past it. It's sad when Mercury, Emerald, Adam, and Cinder have more personality than Salem. Their motivation makes sense. Hers is just entirely absent and selfish. It's just boring. Anyway guys, that's it for this video. I appreciate all the recent subs. You guys are pretty awesome, and if the videos weren't well received, I probably wouldn't make another one. 
That being said, I don't know if this video will have pictures or videos or both. As I said before with my Adam video and my Mercury video, almost any five second clip I use of Ruby gets copyrighted, which doesn't bother me since it is their video content and they deserve any and all ad revenue that I make. But some of them are straight up blocked, which is frustrating when all the clips and audio are synced, then I have to remove a five second glimpse of a character, and once I remove that, suddenly some other section that wasn't copyrighted before is copyrighted now, and it just doesn't make sense, and people are telling me, you know, oh, you, all you gotta do is change the light settings and flip the picture mirror it somehow so that it can't be detected. But if, honestly, if Rooster Teeth Productions just doesn't want their stuff out there, then I don't wanna like, you know, go around that and just repost their content. Even if I'm talking during it and I'm just using clips as references, I still want to kind of respect that they're, it's their it's their thing and I don't want to, you know, uh, God, that's, oof. But anyway, I want to know your guys' theory on this. Is Salem going to summon the gods to kill them or is Salem going to try and absorb them? Or, or, is Salem genuinely trying to die and wants them to come back so that they can undo her spell of immortality? Also, the Four Maidens are Salem and Osmond's children. What do you guys think of that theory? Because I literally just made that up as I watched this again and I realized that and I was just like, oh, well, that's obvious. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate it. And if you managed to watch this far, shout out to my recent subscribers, Sarah, Rolando, Bailey, Crossed, Tom, Kerr, Carter, and Stormy. You guys are awesome. I appreciate the support. And if you would like to support me more, just let people know that this channel exists because it's, uh, I like, I like doing this stuff like this. Uh, bye.